Hello and welcome to this class on complex numbers. Uh, the logic behind this is simply that I'm aware lots of people have missed school because of COVID and uh, I have time on my hands uh, for the same reason. So maybe we can solve uh, a problem here. Um, I pick complex numbers for the first one in this series because it's typically towards the end of a high school math syllabus and therefore would have been in the spring term and very likely to have been missed in the corona lockdown. Um, and it's also a very important subject. It's very easy, but it's very important. Um, so much so that a total familiarity of this is really a prerequisite to, to further study in maths, physics, probably other sciences and engineering. Um, to start certainly to, to your first term at undergraduate physics would be a struggle without this. Um, and, it wouldn't be much of a struggle, it would only take you an hour to pick it up, but uh, it's equivalent to not understanding negative numbers or fractions. It's that important. It's fundamentally part of your number system you have to have for further study. So it's important, you might have missed it. The good news is it's trivially easy. Once you've got the concept across, there's no new maths. Well, everything we do is just apply our existing mass to the new concept and see some very enlightening results. Something really, some really interesting stuff falls out of this. So there's a reward in here too. Okay, um, before we dive in, I wanna try and get across, um, I, I, want, I wanna discard the prejudice that complex numbers and imaginary numbers are somehow um, more contrived, less valid than, than other numbers. And, and my, my reasoning for that is that other than positive integers, all numbers are contrived. All numbers are made up by mathematicians to express the results of mathematics. Um, you know, it, it, negative numbers don't exist naturally in the cosmos. Mathematicians invented them, um, described them, so that they could solve subtraction. You know, subtraction was defined as the inverse of addition. You could always add any two numbers, but oddly, you couldn't subtract any two numbers. The first had to be greater than the second. That asymmetry is unsatisfactory and was solved by the invention of negative numbers. Similarly with fractions, division was the inverse of multiplication and um, you could multiply any two numbers, but you couldn't divide any two numbers until they invented fractions. And that's exactly the same with, uh, with uh, complex numbers. There was a problem that had to be solved and it was unsatisfactory that we, that we couldn't do it, so we invented a number and boom, we can solve it. Um, I'll just, we'll just come on to that in a moment. Once we've done that, once we've defined the, the problem and the solution, we'll just step through how does that work now in all of our basic maths operations. Now, remember, um, um, these are just numbers. So any expressions containing them must continue to follow the rules of maths. The expressions must be, you know, commutative, associative, distributive, etc. So if we just trust that, apply the, these new numbers, let's see where we go. We'll do the basic operations. We'll then, we'll then uh, introduce the uh, geometric concepts of them. Uh, that, will, that will suggest a change of variables and we'll get polar representations. That will lead us on to an exponential form, which is where the, the, the real juice comes in. Um, and enlightenment. And then finally, just for completeness, we'll show logarithms and solve yet another mathematical asymmetry we, we, we don't like. And then just to prove it all works, we'll solve one problem that uses every one of the, the previous things, logs, exponentials, trig, quadratics, roots, etc. We'll do all of that. Okay, so what's the problem? What are we trying to solve? Well, at a young age, we learn that when you multiply negative by negative, you get a positive. And when you multiply positive by positive, you get a positive. So it doesn't seem any, whenever, whatever number you start with, if you square it, you end up with a positive. And that's the, the state of play before the introduction of imaginary numbers. Um, but this is similar to, to subtraction and division prior to the invention of, uh, of negative numbers and fractions. We've got an asymmetry. You can square any number, but you can't square root any number. Square rooting is just the inverse of squaring. You know, you were probably told at school, um, at elementary school, that you can't square root a minus number. Uh, it's undefined. And, and that's not true. You can square root a minus number. It's just until you're taught about imaginary numbers, uh, 
you didn't have a way to express it. You just took the easy way out and said it can't be done. Uh, so let's actually just just do exactly what we did with with minus numbers and frankly just invent a new number and that number is i. i is the square root of minus one. Now actually it's probably, I don't know but I guess more rigorously it's probably defined as i squared equals minus one because square root is only defined as the inverse of square rooting so it's probably more fundamental to start like that. i squared is minus one. Now that allows us now to take the square root of any number. Now, the square root of minus 16 is clearly the square root of minus one times the square root of 16, you know, uh, and we've just defined that as i. So the answer square root of minus 16 would be four i. So we can see immediately how, how it would work and how, and how simple it is to, to use. And of course, it's a number, so you know, you add two of them, you're gonna get two i, two i plus another one is gonna be three i, Noth nothing clever there. Uh, uh, I squared is minus one by definition. I cubed is clearly I times I squared. So minus I, I four is clearly I squared times I squared, which is minus one times minus one, which is one, etc. cetera. So uh, pretty, pretty simple stuff. We can now take the square root of any real number uh, in this manner. Let's, Let's do something uh, a little more, perhaps still one of the most basic mathematical things we consider, and that's a polynomial. Let's say we had a polynomial that was a1 plus some x, plus some x squared, plus some x cubed. So it, it doesn't have to be an infinite series, it's just, just a polynomial. If x was now one of these new imaginary numbers, let's say x was uh, 2i, just for example, it doesn't matter. We hadn't defined these a's anyway. But if it was 2i, what would that sum to? If this was real numbers, we would want an expression for the sum of that series. Well, it would be in this case a0 plus, well, x is now 2i, so 2a1i. Uh, and the 2i squared would be, uh, 2i squared would be minus 4, minus 4, so we'd have minus 4a2. Uh, cubed would be minus eight a three i um let's say let's assume there was another one just just make it a little longer that would then be plus 16 a four and the x the i's would cancel again so we would be you know similar expression but if you notice all the odd powers have an i and all the even powers are just normal real numbers so we can add up all the real parts, the a0, 4a2, 16a4, and they add up to just a real number. It doesn't matter what these coefficients are here, because we didn't know what the a's were anyway. Just we know that they add up to a real number. And all of these odd ones add up to another amount of imaginary numbers, some amount of i's, where r and i are real numbers, but the i, big i, represents a real number amount of imaginary units. And so we've, we've got a compound number. The sum of this polynomial is a compound number with a real component and an imaginary component. And it turns out that's the general form of a number. Some amount of real, some amount of imaginary, and that's what we call a complex number. And all numbers should be viewed of potentially as a complex number. Often the imaginary component is zero, so it's a real number. Other times the imaginary component is zero, so it's a wholly imaginary number, but the general form allows for both components. And throughout this, I'll express the general unknown form of the number as x plus i, y, where we're trying to solve for the two unknowns, the two components of our number, x, uh, the real component, y, the imaginary component. Okay, so now we've got complex numbers not just imaginary numbers you know how do we manipulate them well it's it's pretty straightforward if you had say one number like that and you wanted to add it to another number like that they're two generalized uh, complex numbers you just treat the real and imaginary parts separately so the real parts are the two and the four and the imaginary parts are the three i and the five i so simple as that uh, what if you wanted to multiply them no. You would treat it as a normal algebraic expression where the 
imaginary parts and the real parts are treated separately. So expand the brackets, you get two times four, eight, you get three i times five i, so that's minus 15. So they're all real numbers. And then the other parts would add up to three i times four, so 12 i, and uh, five i times two, 10. So that's a, a imaginary part. So we have minus seven plus 22 i. That's the answer to that. Okay, what about division? Let's say we wanted to take those same two numbers, two plus three i divided by four plus five i. How do we divide those? Well, in a moment, we're gonna come up with a uh, formulaic um, way of, 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 of solving um, divisions. But for now, let's do it longhand. How would we solve that? If it was any other algebraic form, you would just equate it to the unknown and solve for the unknown. So it's two unknowns, unfortunately, but no difference. Uh, I would multiply both sides by the denominator, like that. Um, expand that one on the top, so we'd have four x minus five y. That's the real component. And the imaginary component is five x plus four y, and that has to equal. Remember, two plus three i. The, the numerator that's left over. So now we have, if we equate the real and imaginary components, we have four x minus five y must equal the real component two, and five x plus four y must equal the imaginary component of three from there. So we've got two equations in two unknowns, it's pretty simple. You would, um, uh, I would cross multiply those, subtract and to get rid of the x and then substitute that in. And I actually did this earlier just to save us time. And it comes out that x equals 23 over 41, y comes out to two over 41. So our answer, uh, our division is best, most neatly expressed as 23 plus 2i all over 41. So that's division, simple enough. Okay, before we uh, go on to other functions, we should just point something out here is that we've now lost the concept of numbers being um, a, linear, uh, a linear scale. We can't say that one number is bigger than another. Before we could, when we thought of numbers as a single linear scale, we could say 10 is bigger than uh, pi, which is bigger than e, which is bigger than zero, which is bigger than minus pi, etc. Now numbers are an ordered pair of a real bit and an imaginary bit. So you can't say that a coordinate is bigger or smaller than another coordinate. You could say it's got more realness or it's got more imaginariness, but overall, you know, it's not it's it's not on a scale. But we we do want to define a magnitude for numbers, and this is what we call the modulus. The modulus of a number say a, uh, we normally write, actually, actually we usually just write mod alpha, and, and we, we write that mathematically usually as just two bars, vertical bars either side of it like that. And that scale, that magnitude, is defined in a Pythagorean way as x squared plus y squared, if, if, if alpha was x plus i y, as we will assume here, <laughs> henceforth. Okay, so we have, we have a, a, a magnitude, the mod of, of the number. The other thing to bear in mind is our original definition was i squared equals minus one, for which there's two solutions, you know, uh, plus or minus i. Um, now, we hadn't haven't any other input to this definition that's everything so we can't tell the difference between plus i and minus i they're both that's all we've got you know we one plus i isn't any way preferable to minus i if we invert them the whole maths should continue completely unchanged and therefore changing x plus i y to x minus i y should have some special properties most particularly it shouldn't change the physical results of an environment that is defined uh, in, in complex terms. Um, uh, this is called the complex conjugate. And we usually refer to the process of putting that minus in as taking the complex conjugate or creating the complex conjugate. Uh, and complex conjugate of a number alpha is normally designated with a bar over the top. Similarly, x plus i, y 
you put a bar over the top and it equals x minus i y. Okay, simple, we'll use that a lot. We'll use the mod and the complex conduit quite a lot. You've got to be confident just, just manipulating these. Um, right, I've actually uh, run out of a bit of space here, so I'm going to write really small. A um, couple of things to note. The mod of um, the mod of the complex conjugate is clearly the same as the mod as the original number. It's x squared plus y squared. Doesn't matter whether you'd put an i in front of the y, uh, a minus in front of the y or not. It's, that's the same. So that's an interesting thing. The other thing is, if you multiply a number by its own complex conjugate, you get x squared minus y squared. If you think of it just quickly, x plus y, x plus i y, x minus i y. If you, make, if you think of it through, the real component is x squared minus y squared, and the imaginary components are going to cancel. Okay, M rearranging these, rearranging all of these, we get 1 over alpha equals the complex conjugate of alpha over the mod squared. That's just rearranging these equations. Now, what we've got here is the reciprocal of a complex number. We've got a formulaic way of doing division. If you want to divide a number, instead, all you do is you multiply it by its complex conjugate and divide it by its mod squared. So let's just do a quick example of that. Um, one plus two i, say over three plus four i. How would we do that? Well, that's one plus two i times the complex conjugate of three plus four i, three minus four i, all over the mod of that squared, which is, well, you can see the mod's gonna be five, it's a three, four, five triangle, so 25. Multiply that top out, you get uh, three plus eight, that's the real component, and the imaginary component is six, minus four all over 25 so 11 plus uh, 2i over 25 I should have put the 25 in front of it but there we go okay so we can do we have a formulaic way of doing division right the the, the next thing is think about square rootings here um, if we wanted to do a square root say 3 plus 4i how would we do it now, in a moment, we'll do a formulaic way of doing this once we've done the polar, polar coordinates versions of this. But until then, we would just go about it algebraically, just equate it to our unknown, square both sides. And by the way, you're gonna get very quick at squaring these things. It's pretty, you, you don't even have to think about them. It's x, the real part is x squared minus y squared, and the imaginary part, two x, y, i. Um, so again, two, two equations in two unknowns, x squared minus y squared has got to equal the real part, three, and x, y has got to equal two, so the imaginary part, so two equations in two in this. Now we can just substitute an answer here. Actually, it gets a bit fiddly because of the squares and you can lose track of signs. One thing that I find is really useful and quickens things up is to remember the square of the mod is equal to the mod of the square. Uh, that's just, uh, a result of this lot. That's square of the mod is the mod of square. So if we look at this, that's three plus four i is the square. You know, it was a square root was what we we're trying to solve. So that's the square. So therefore, uh, the mod of the square, the mod of that is five. It's a three, four, five triangle. So we know five equals, and the square of the mod, well, the square of the mod is x squared plus y squared by definition. So we've got Two equations in two unknowns here. It's a bit easy to solve. That's eight, two x squared. Therefore, x equals uh, one, two, plus or minus two. Substituting that into there gives us y equals plus or minus one uh, with the signs in the same order as x. So our solution to three plus four i is plus or minus two plus i, two plus i. Okay, um, let's do one more, let's do one more. This is too important to miss. What would be the square root of i itself? 
i being the square root of minus one. So in essence, what's one of the fourth roots of i? Uh, two of them. Um, do the same again, x plus i, y, let's square both sides, x squared minus y squared plus two x, y, i. The real component is zero, so x, x squared minus y squared is zero, x must equal plus or minus y, easy. We can uh, substitute, we could do the square of the mod equals mod squared, but it's, it's not worth it. We've already got the real component solved in that sense. So let's just substitute that straight in there. That gives us two x squared uh, equals one. So x equals y. Oh, by the way, that's also telling us that x is plus y. They've got to have the same sign in this instance. So uh, one over root two. Have I got that right? No, root two. Sorry, it's root two. No, no, it's one over root two. Yep. Um, and therefore, square root of i equals one over root two plus or minus one plus i. So that's the square root of i, which is itself the square root of minus one. Okay, you should be pretty comfortable taking square roots of numbers, whether they're simple like that or complex like that. Okay, quadratics. Um, this doesn't really have to do anything. I just, just want to make a point that the, uh, the uh, way of doing quadratics doesn't really change between real and imaginary numbers, or complex numbers. It, it's also worth remembering that um, this whole thing started with the quadratic. If you think of it, the initial problem was how do we solve that? You know, alpha squared equals minus one or alpha squared plus one equals one. That's a quadratic. Uh, and we solved it by saying, well, uh, i is a solution and Minus i is a solution. There's our two solutions. You multiply that out. Boom. You got your, you got your quadratic. Um, that's our normal way of doing a, solving a quadratic. If you can factorize it, you factorize it. There's your answers. If you can't, you use the old schoolboy of uh, it's uh, minus b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Remember that from you know, uh, junior math. Um, now, the trouble with this is we were told that it worked unless the expression under the square root um, was, was negative and then it didn't work. So you had this wonderful thing that worked until it didn't work. And, and that's another one of those unsatisfactory uh, problems. The, there is nothing wrong with that equation. It is derived correctly, it is correct, and it always works. The fact that your teachers told you you couldn't do it was not that the formula was wrong, it's that you couldn't write the answer of this expression if it was negative you just didn't have the eyes to write it but it always works a little side comment in most problems in physics you'll come across the coefficients will be real difficult to you know most of the time that the, the primary problem is going to start off with real coefficients and the answers will be complex real imagine real complex uh, but these coefficients needn't be doesn't matter, it can be as complex as you like, it's just that they generally will be. However complex they are, doesn't matter. The formula always works. So be confident just to plug the numbers in and keep going. Right, now we have um, uh, numbers expressed as two components. So a number is say x plus i, y. And from here on, I'm gonna be a bit shorthand. I'm just gonna to refer to them sometimes as x, y like that, two components. That should point out to us that Numbers are now a bit like a coordinate pair. So if we have, we should be able to plot them on a geometric view like this and say, this is the real axis, this is the imaginary axis, and a number here, alpha, has this amount x of real, this amount y of i's, and it can be positions of plus. So all numbers, oops, I'm there, all numbers are just just uh, numbers on apply, excuse me, I'm, I've hit some setup, there we go. Um, just numbers on a plot like this. And that can give us some, uh, some extra insight. But the most important thing it does is suggest to us a transformation of variables. In normal geometry, we'll often say, you know, find that physical systems are defined uh, cylindrically or spherically, and so a, um, um, a polar form of coordinates is more, more powerful. And so it is here, we can say, that point x, or point alpha, can be described not just in terms of x and y, but in terms of r and theta. 
So now I'm going to say um, um, uh, alpha is not just x plus i y, it's r theta. And r is the length of that, the hypotenuse. So of course it's a, it's a mod again. So it's the mod of alpha. And theta is 10 to the minus 1 y over x. That's fiddly. We don't like tangents, uh, especially not inverse tangents. So, so we'll rarely do that. We'll start with thetas and we'll stay with thetas right through. Uh, so r, that's the mod. Theta, the term we use for that is the arg, the arg of alpha. Uh, I don't know whether that stands for argument or argand number, but the arg is theta. The last thing to note about this is that theta is now potentially multivalued. If you add two pi to it, the numbers, nothing's really changed. You've just gone all the way around. In fact, you can add any number of two pi's to it. So you will often purposely add or subtract a two pi to bring your number around into your preferred coordinate system. Normally, theta goes from naught to two pi. So in this instance, that would look like that. So you define it, measure it from the x-axis, noughts degrees, or naught to two pi. You can also go from minus pi to pi. Some books do this. That's the equivalent of going, um, how do I get it, minus pi, going like that. Doesn't really make any difference. You just got to add pi to it to bring it around to where you want. Okay. Let's now do uh, multiplication. Oh, sorry, we didn't finish that transformation of variables. So that's going from Cartesian to polar. Just a number, though, was x plus i, y. So we got x now. If you look at x on here, it's clearly r cos theta. So x equals r cos theta. y equals r sine theta. So our number, a generic x plus i, y, should now be written as, it's getting a bit cramped on here, uh, it should now be written as r into cos theta plus i sine theta. And that's our polar expression for x plus i, y. Let's say we wanted to multiply two numbers uh, in polar form. We had an one number expressed with one r and one arg, and we wanted to multiply that by another number with a different mod and a different arg. How would you do that? Well, let's write them out. That's r1, and it, remember it's cos theta plus i sine theta times r2 cos theta 2, let's put the ones in, plus i sine theta 2. Let's expand that, R1, R2. What's the real component? Well, let's do it. It's cos theta 1, cos theta 2, minus sine theta 1, sine theta 2. And the imaginary component is sine theta 1, cos theta 2, plus cos theta 1, sine two. That looks a bit messy now. It's starting to get a bit, bit long-winded, but the eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed that that actually is in our formula book. That is the expression for the, uh, the cos of a sum. It's cos theta 1 plus theta 2. So that's nice. And this, similarly, is the expression for the sine of a sum. Should have not done that. There we go. Uh, and therefore, our answer what have we done? We've said r1 theta 1 times r2 theta 2 equals r1 times r2. And our angle is theta 1 plus theta 2. As a coordinate system, we've multiplied one of the coordinates. And added the other. So multiplication has the effect of you 
multiply the mods and you add the args. Simple as that. In polar coordinates, you can see how easy it is to do multiplication. Now, this is a simplest formulaic way of doing multiplication. If they're expressed in, in polar form, just multiply the mods and add the args. Now, it's no surprise that with division, you go through the same thing, long-winded just as we did, and you get up to the fact that with division, you uh, divide the mods and subtract the args. And the, we could just accept that, or we could do it long-winded, or I'm gonna do a med middle ground here and just use our, um, our formula, one over alpha, alpha bar over alpha squared. We can use that to do our division. We're gonna remember that the uh, complex conjugate is x minus i y, which is now r cos theta minus i sine theta, which conveniently is the same as cos minus theta plus i sine minus theta because cos is an even function and sine is an odd function. So what we basically said is that uh, the mod of r theta, sorry, the, the complex conjugate of r theta is r minus theta. So now we can just insert that expression into there to do our division. So, uh, r1 theta 1 over r2 theta 2 is going to equal r1 theta 1 times r2 minus theta 2. Just put a comma there so that we can see their coordinates, not actual numbers. Uh, and we know how to multiply. It's r1, oh, hold on, over, I'm going to put the, the mod squared, so r already is the mod r2 squared. So now have r1, that cancels out with that one. So we have over r2 and theta, we add the angles, but we're adding a minus angle. So yeah, of course, we knew where we we're going, but this was just a tinsy bit more rigorous and just assuming it, we divide the mods and we subtract the args in division. All right, well, if, if we, um, now that we know that when you multiply polar numbers, you basically just add the angles and compound the, uh, the, the mods, that squaring it is clearly going to be r squared to theta. And r theta to the n is clearly r to the n and theta. That's really powerful. That's really useful. We can go a step further. R theta nth root is nth root of r and theta over n. Wow, that's a quick way of taking roots. Even just square roots, you just root the, the mod and halve the theta. A little trick though is you've got to remember it's multi, might be multi-valued and you might need to keep adding two pi's to get every one of your solutions. Um, let's just do a quick example. Somebody asks you, what's the cube root of eight? Before today, you could quickly have said two. But that's a, a cubic without a quadratic or a linear term. There must be three different answers. What are the other two answers? Well, let's express eight in polar coordinates. It's a wholly real number, but it still has polar coordinates. R of it is eight, and the arg is zero radians. So the nth root of that, nth root of eight, zero, so the third root is gonna be the third root of eight times theta over three plus two pi, or plus uh, four pi. Have we on it? There's our three answers. Zero, there, uh, that. So we get eight, zero, eight, two pi over three. Sorry, two, zero. We've cube rooted it. And two, four pi over three. 
How do they look on our argand diagram? There's eight. There's two. So there's two. Uh, there's two pi. Two pi over three. There's another two pi. So give us four pi over three. There's our three answers, evenly spread on a equilateral triangle around a circle of radius two. And we know by now that that there is going to be minus one, that there is going to be root three. So we know our answers are two and minus one plus root three i and minus one minus root three i. There are our three answers to the cube root of eight. And in fact, we can, if we just forget R, just assume R equals one for now, just so we're working on the rest of it. If you want to take, and that's one, you want to take any root of this, basically you're dividing the full two pi circle into how many roots? The nth root of R, if you want to, we just did the third, it's there, there and there. What if you wanted the six roots? Well, you divide it into six, so it'd be there, there, and there also. What if you wanted to do the fifth root? Well, you'd just be the pentagon. There would be your five answers. So really quick now to do roots. Doesn't matter if somebody asks you to do the 180, 180th roots of one, well, you know there, divide two pi into 180 like that. And you'd have all the answers very quick and simple okay now when we uh spotted that uh r um r theta to the n equals r to the n n theta we glossed over something very very interesting what we're saying here is r cos theta plus i sine theta to the n, put an n there, is equal to r to the n cos n theta plus i sine n theta. Just forget the r's for the moment. Look, we have cos theta i sine theta equals cos n theta i sine n theta. The n drops in to the argument. Now, that's just shocking, isn't it? That's a really remarkable expression. It's known as de Moivre's theory. Um, it drops out naturally from our polar form of complex numbers. It just drops out as a natural form, and it's quite remarkable. The only reason you don't really come across such a great formula very often is actually it's just a, a specific example of an even more remarkable general formula we'll come on to right now. Okay, so taking a bit of a sideward step, we know that um, the, uh, we, we define the exponential function as a serious expansion, one plus x plus x squared over two plus x cubed over three factorial, and so forth. Like that. And for some neatness, some people might want to do that. <laughs> um, Okay, what if x is no longer a real number, but now is an imaginary number, some amount of i? Is that, first of all, you might need to confirm that it makes sense. Does putting an imaginary number in this exponential expansion make sense? Specifically, does it converge? You can't have an infinite series. You can't do much with an infinite series unless it converges. Uh, it does. It's worth looking that up for yourself. We don't want to distract ourselves now. It's a fairly straightforward and quick thing to prove. But yes, just as it converges with the real number as the exponent, so it does with an imaginary number. It just, it's just a two-dimensional version of the proof in essence. Okay. Um, let's put that in. Let's put it in. And e to the i theta equals 1 plus i theta plus i theta squared over 2. So they so cancel, so you get minus theta squared over 2 minus theta cubed over 3 factorial. Um, 
no doubt I've got that right. Minus I. Um, plus theta to the four over four factorial, plus theta to the five I over five factorial, minus theta to the six over six factorial, minus theta to the seven I. Basically, all the odd powers, or so all the even powers, the i's cancel and just exchange signs as they double cancel every time. And all the odd powers retain an i in them. So let's just pull out the real and imaginary components. The real bit is 1 minus theta squared over 2 plus theta 4 over 4 factorial plus theta, oops, minus theta 6 over 6. Etc. And the imagine dot 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 the imaginary part are the odd ones. So theta minus uh, theta cubed over three plus theta five over five theta seven over seven etc. So the sum of the exponential series results in two series: series of the real component, series of the imaginary component. And again, the eagle eye of you might have recognized that. That is our expansion, our definition of cos theta. And this is our expansion of sine theta. So we've just proven that e to the i theta equals cos theta plus i sine theta. And that really is rather remarkable. I'm just going to put that up on the next page e to the i theta equals cos theta plus i sine theta. It's remarkable for a number of reasons. One, we've, we've just gotten rid of a horrible trigonometric expression down to one simple, really lovely uh, exponential thing. The other thing is that e to the i theta to the n, of course, is e to the i n theta. You just drop powers in like that. Uh, so there is De Marvel's theorem proven. We've just made a raise something to the power becomes its own argument inside. So De Marvel's theorem is just an example of this. This, by the way, is known as Euler's law. Very important rule in in, uh, in maths. Now, the the other thing to to uh, the, that gets us excited about this, a couple of things. One is it's simpler than trig. E, e exponentials are the nicest things to handle. They're, they're easy to differentiate, easy to integrate. You can invert them by just logarithming them. It's, they're, they're great to deal with. The other thing is you immediately spot, you would spot it more quickly this than in the, uh, the, the longhand form. You spot here that e to the i theta is the solution to so many wave equations you're gonna come across. If you think about it, um, if you would differentiate that once, you, the i drops down. You differentiate it twice, two i's drop down, becomes a negative. So we have d to any function that is expressed like this, where its second order differential is negative itself, you know the solution is of that form, or a solution is of that form. Uh, and this is your standard wave equation. If you think about it, nearly every wave equation has this kind of a form. Um, it's uh, even something as simple as like Young's law, pulling a, str pulling a spring, um, the acceleration, the rate of change of displacement in this case, is equal to minus the displacement. So you end up with a spring. And in fact, the standardized form that you're, of, of the solution of a wave equation, generally you're going to find, so you're going to be trying to solve something, or trying to create something that looks like um, something like that, where uh, the, the, the argument, the arg of, of it is, is cyclical on, uh, on displacement and on, and on time. You know, if you think of waving a string, a wave in that, it's, its position is cyclical in distance along it and in time as you wave it. So we're always looking for this, and we know the generalized solution is e to the i theta or e to the i something like that. Really worth knowing and having that at the front of your mind. Okay, and, and just to remind you, that's why we're excited about this. <laughs> right, last thing, last thing before we, we practice it all in a problem. Um, 
we were told at school, at some point in school, we were told that you can't take the logarithm of a negative number. In fact, sometimes I heard it, you know, it's undefined. Um, you can't take the logarithm of zero because it's infinity or minus infinity, whatever. Uh, I'm all right with that. You know, that's a single asymptote. Maths, science is full of asymptotes. But I don't like the fact being, you've been told you can't take the logarithm of a negative number. It sounds like not being able to take the square root of a negative number. There might be something wrong here. And indeed, there is. You can take the logarithm of any number except for zero. So let's do it. What's the logarithm of x, of alpha? Uh, a generic number, real, imaginary, or complex. Well, do it the same way. Equate it to our unknown. Let's exponent, exponent both sides to get rid of the log. Uh, and that equals e to the x, e to the i, y. Now, alpha, uh, that's our known. So we can write it out if you like. We know what that is. I'm going to say it's e to the i theta. That's how I'm going to pretend I got it in polar form. So let's put r e to the i theta equals that. Now let's equate the, the different parts of that solution. Clearly, r must equal e to the x. Therefore, x must equal log r. What is r? r is the mod of our number. Log mod alpha. So the real component of our answer, x, is log of the mod of the number we started with. What about y? Well, e to the i theta equals e to the i y. Therefore, y equals theta plus potentially some other amounts of 2 pi that bring it back round into the relevant range. Um, therefore, y is the arg of our original number plus 2 pi. So we now know that log of any number is the log of the mod of the number plus i, the arg of that number, plus maybe two pi. So yes, there is an answer to, to the log of every number. And in fact, let's just think of the negative. Specifically, we got ne what's log of negative k? Let's take k is a positive number. Well, it's log of the mod of k, which is k, plus i times the arg of k, which is a negative number, that's pi. So the log of a num negative number is just the log, of the, the log of that positive version of that number plus i pi. Boom, simple. You can take logs of negative numbers. It's the same as the log. The real component is the same as the log of the positive number. The imaginary component is i pi, always. OK, let's solve something. Right, this is quite neat, quite simple, but actually demonstrates everything we've done so far. First thing is, I don't like that. I don't like trigger not triggering things. They're, they're fiddly, it's hard to solve, unless, unless they're standalone. Um, we're solving for alpha. Uh, how do I get rid of cos? Well, remember Euler's law. E to the i alpha equals cos alpha plus i sine alpha. That doesn't get rid of it. What about e to the minus i alpha? Well, that equals cos alpha minus i sine alpha. Let's add those two together. And we get e to the i alpha plus e to the minus i alpha equals two cos alpha. Ta-da! We can get rid of the cos alpha now. So let's substitute that into that. And we get, let's put it go up here, we get 2e to the i alpha plus 2e to the minus i alpha minus 3 plus i equals 0. Now, that may look worse than what we started with, but whenever you have two elements in an equation like this of equal but opposite powers like that, you've got a quadratic in disguise. If you just multiply this whole thing through by e to the i alpha, you get 2e to the 2i alpha minus 3 plus i e to the i alpha plus 2 equals 0. 
And that's clearly a quadratic in e to the i alpha. How do you solve that? Well, e to the i alpha now, let's use our quadratic formula. It's minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac. So minus b is 3 plus i plus or minus square root b squared. That's 3 plus i squared. What's 3 plus i squared? It's it's going to be 9 minus 1, so 8, and it's going to be plus 6i. So we can put 8 plus 6i uh, minus 4ac, so that's minus 4 times 2 times 2, minus 16, all over 2a, which is 4. Okay, how do we, we've got to solve that bit inside the brackets. We want the square root of minus 8 plus 6i. Let's just do it our normal way, x plus i, y, 8 minus 8 plus 6i equals x squared minus y squared plus 2xyi. Uh, mod of the square is the square of the mod, so x squared plus y squared equals 8 squared plus 6 squared square root, that's 10. Now, equating the real parts here and adding them up, I'm running out of space here, it gives us 2 equals 2x squared, so x equals plus or minus 1. Substitute that into there. Gives us, um, hold on, that, that, that imaginary bar gives us x, y equals 3. So substituting that in there, y equals plus or minus 3 in the same order. Let's take this on to the next page. We have, where are we, where are we? Yep, we have e to the i alpha equals, where were we, we were three plus i, three plus i, plus or minus, and we've just solved, we've just solved that bit under the brackets, it's uh, one plus three i, all over four that has two answers does this two two sets of answers uh one is um one plus i is that right yep and the other answer I'll do it over here is hold on. one plus i is a half one minus i there we go. There's our two solutions for e to the i alpha. Therefore, i alpha is log of that, 1 plus i. How do we do the log of that? Well, it's the log of the mod, and the mod of that is root 2. So it's log of root 2 plus the arg of the number. And the arg of that, oops, is, uh, well, it's going across one and up one. It's a, it's a pi by four plus two k pi as well. Now, I don't like square roots inside my log, so I'll take that out and say half log two plus i pi by four plus two pi k. Now, that's i alpha. I want alpha, so we just got to divide through by i, that makes the imagined part the real part, so pi by 4 plus 2 pi k, that's the real part, and the imaginary part now, uh, dividing by that, so that's minus i, um, log 2 over 2. And this answer coming down here, it's the same thing, i alpha is going to be the log of that, and the log, that's, let's see, what's the mod of that, that's root 2, isn't it? So it's log, so 1 over root 2, log 1 over root 2, plus, and the arg is minus pi by 4. So that's the answer to that. Again, I don't like roots inside my log, so I'll say that's minus a half log 2, plus i, that bit. Now we want alpha, not i alpha, so we divide through. That gives us minus pi by four 
plus 2k pi. That's the real bit. And the imaginary bit is log 2 over 2. There we go. There's our answers. Looks fiddly. Just, just neaten that up. But actually, let's just plot them and we'll see what we've got. Here's our argon plane. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And our first number is pi by four minus i log two by two. So pi by four is a bit less than one. Log two is about 0.7, so 0.35 minus 0.35. So our first number, first solution is there. Our second solution is minus pi by four and plus log two by two. So it's the diametrically opposite one. So there's our primary solutions. Minus pi by four along and log minus log two to there. But just remember, we also have Two, you can add 2 pi to this any number of times, and you can subtract 2 pi from it any number of times, and similarly with this one. So there's a whole series of answers. These are our primary ones, but depending on the problem, we might need to consider all the other ones too. So that's it, very simple. I hope you enjoyed uh, getting there. Um, just to summarize, Imaginary numbers and complex numbers are essential parts of your mathematical toolkit. They're numbers. Ignoring them is like ignoring negative numbers or fractions. They're part of the overall set and they're the complete set. We don't, doesn't seem that we have to find any more kinds of numbers. This seems to be so far in maths, the complete set of numbers. And to miss most of them, which is what you'd be doing, uh, seems, uh, seems negligent. Um, they're, they're numbers, so all expressions containing them must obey the same rules of maths that, that, that other numbers do, commutative, associative, distributive, whatever they are. Uh, and if we force our way through, we get valid answers. And specifically, we get some enlightenment around the cyclical nature of, of, of exponential expressions containing E, uh, exponential expressions containing I. Um, we get an enlightenment on, on um, numbers being uh, more than just a linear view of things. Uh, I hope this is useful to you and I hope this allows you to just use these numbers hereafter in your, in your maths and physics. Good luck.